Hi, I'm Wes Allen with DM Tales, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Iron Falcon, the retro clone of original D&D. Let's roll it. Before we begin, I want to give a shout out to Kevin from Connecticut because I did not buy my copy of Iron Falcon. It came in a box that he very thoughtfully sent me a few months back, and I'm very glad to have this copy to review for you today. Let's get into the review. Iron Falcon has a little bit of an interesting history because it is created by Chris Donnerman, who also created Basic Fantasy RPG which is the game that he created first. It is, as I said in the opening, a retro clone of OD&D, and it was made, he says, kind of tongue-in-cheek out of spite. Apparently, at one point during the early days of the OSR renaissance, even before it was called OSR, uh, he saw a list of retro clones listed on Wikipedia and found out that his basic fantasy RPG game was no longer considered a retro clone, even though he was one of the pioneers of the retro clone movement. And this annoyed him a little bit. He tells a great story about it, and I'll actually put a link to it below. It's a really worth listening to. So anyway, he created Iron Falcon to be a straight up retro clone, and this is the result. Now its layout has a very good design. It is done in a sans serif font, which differentiates it from Basic Fantasy RPG, which uses a serif font. And so by using a sans serif font for this book, it really shows the reader this is not that game, this is something different. And I do appreciate it. The headings and the body font are actually very well done. I would say that the sans serif font for the body text is a little bit on the light side. It's a little more difficult for me to read than Basic Fantasy RPG but it's not onerous, I could get through it just fine. As with all of Chris Gonnerman's books, the table design is very clean. It does not use the more current standard of using alternating table row colors in order to help the readability of the layout, but the lines that it uses in between the rows still makes it very readable, even if it looks quote unquote dated. I might prefer the alternating row colors, that's just what I like a little better, but this works very well. I can't complain at all. The one point in the book that I feel there's a little bit of a lack is with artwork. There's not a whole lot of it. What is there harkens back to the old pencil and ink drawings that you would have found in Mold Bay Cook and even earlier than that in OD&D and the Holmes Basic set. But there's just not a ton. You're flipping through and it's constantly page after page of text. However, the layout is really well done and it uses things like tables and section headings to break up the flow. So you don't notice that there's not a whole lot of artwork until you go looking for it. It's a pretty nice trick, but I still would have liked to see more pictures. Now the prose of the book is interesting. It went for the OD&D feel, and it succeeded, but in doing so, I think it pulled in a lot of that OD&D ambiguity that is the stuff of legend at this point. And the one point this really came out for me was with multiclassing. In this game, demi-humans can take up multiple classes, and they have to divide the experience points that they earn between each class as equally as they possibly can. However, the advancement tables for each of the classes is different in the original version of the game, and so one class is probably going to be advancing a lot faster than the other class. So they advance asynchronously. What was confusing for me is, as I read the paragraph explaining how multiclassing works, I could not figure out when I rolled hit points. The rule is, you are rolling hit points for both character classes, but you're always keeping the higher number. And that was where the confusion was. I thought it was a roll just for that level, but that's not what it is. In reality, when you're multiclassing, you are going to be keeping two separate pools of hit points. And you're going to roll for each as you level up and always use the higher of the two pools for your hit point total. It's simple enough once you figure it out, but I actually had to reach out to Chris Gonnerman and say, hey, I'm a little confused on this point. What is actually going on here? And he did say that this is something that he thought was rather clear, but there are a lot of people who ask this question, so he might go back and do a rewrite at some point. 
It makes sense once I figured it out, but it was a little bit weird at that point. And that was something that I think is because of the way that OD&D was written. You're trying to emulate that feel, you're going to get some of the ambiguity that leaves people going, er? It's interesting in this book that spells are pretty much all description. You have a title, you have the level of the spell and which class can cast it, and then it's just a description. There is no handy chart with things like duration or area effect or range. You have to read that in the paragraph text. Again, I think this is the way OD&D must have worked. We're going for that feel, but it's not quite as easy to look down and glance and glean the information out of as it is in basic fantasy RPG, where you do have the nice table that shows you all that basic information in a nicely arranged chart. Monster listings are similarly clean. I actually said that similarly correct twice in a row. Yay me. It uses a table with the wonderful design layout that Chris Gonerman has come out with. It's just thin lines in between each row that has all the basic information on it. Below that is a description of the monster, sometimes about behavior, and oftentimes it will have descriptions of some of its special effects. So again, you're going to be digging a little bit more to pick something up about what a creature can do rather than just glancing at a chart. There's an interesting omission in each of the creature listings. XP is nowhere to be found. This is something that I've always seen in just about every edition of the game, but it's not here in Iron Falcon. Instead, you're supposed to take the hit dice and the number of special abilities that each creature has and go to a unified chart and figure out exactly how much each creature is worth in terms of XP if you defeat it, bypass it, or kill it. And it's a little bit uh, more legwork for the game master at this point, but it's just something that OD&D must have done, so Iron Falcon's going to do it as well. Now, there are only four classes in this game, Fighter, Magic User, Cleric, and Thief. There are five races. That's Human, Dwarf, Halfling, Elf, and Half-Elf. So, not a huge amount of variation, but again, this is the way the original game worked. Although, Thief, interestingly enough, was actually part of a supplemental class. It was not part of the original game. That's kind of fun that it's here in Iron Falcon. Demi-humans do have special abilities. Some of them have infravision, so they can see in the dark, and others of them have bonuses to their levels for their saving throws. Each class has its own saving throw table, and if you are a halfling or a dwarf, you're going to be rolling a number that's a level higher than what you actually are. It's an interesting way of essentially saying you have plus one, plus two, or plus three on a specific save. Now, it's a little bit different way of looking at it, but you get to look at tables, and that's always a fun thing. As I said earlier, demi-humans also can multi-class. They will split their experience points between each class as evenly as possible. They will continue to have to pay XP for both classes even after they've capped out in their other class. This is going to come into play once you get to higher levels and your hit point bonuses come out. Because if you've capped out as a fighter and you have like 27 hit points and you have a thief pool that has maybe 20 hit points and you're only going to get so many hit points per level as you advance, you're going to be stuck at the 27 hit points for a quite a while until you start getting above that with your thief hit point pool. It makes it a rather interesting concept. Is it worth multiclassing at this point? Maybe. It uses the six standard ability scores, but they are split up into two different groups. The first is the group of prime requisites for each class. That is strength for the fighter, intelligence for the magic user, wisdom for the cleric, and dexterity for the thief. The second group is the universal attributes, and that's constitution and charisma. It's interesting that bonuses aren't consistent even internally for each score. For example, if you have a score of 13 to 15 in your strength, you're going to get a plus one to hit, but you don't get any bonuses to damage the way that you do in, say, Moldvay and Cook, Basic and Expert. Dexterity bonuses, they only begin at 15. To go along with this, however, penalties also aren't as harsh. Strength and constitution penalties actually begin at a score of six instead of eight, and so that average range is a little bit wider. And also, they never get more than minus two in a penalty, so you're not hit as much for having a low score. It kind of balances itself out in the end. 
It's also interesting to note that some of the ability bonuses are really only meant to apply to certain classes. The strength bonuses, for example, as you read the book, are meant to apply only to fighters, although it's left in parentheses that the GM may actually decide to override this and give it to everyone. This makes a lot of sense, and I imagine that people who are playing the original version of the game would go, if I have a 17 strength, shouldn't I still be able to get a bonus for smacking something harder than somebody else? That only makes sense. And so that's left in the game. Some bonuses only apply to specific classes. If you look at the chart for the intelligence bonuses, for example, they only really apply to magic users. Although if you have a higher intelligence, you can actually speak more languages. There's no bonus given to you that's mechanical for having a high intelligence score unless you are a magic user. It's fascinating to me that Wisdom has no mechanical bonus to the player character at all. I would have expected at some point that your high Wisdom score could have been applied to your turning abilities to turn undead and make them flee away from you, but that's not part of this original game. And then you have Dexterity, which is the prime requisite for a thief, but those bonuses can apply to anyone. So anyone can get a bonus to missile attacks or an armor class bonus, depending on how high their score is is. It's a little bit of a mess. There's no consistency going through it, and I can see why Mold Van Cook and then later Basic Fantasy RPG after it try to simplify things a lot, because the simplified just makes more sense to me. This is not to say that having a high prerequisite score has no benefit whatsoever, because if you have a high prerequisite, you're going to get a bonus to your experience points that you gain. A score from 13 to 15 will net you a plus 5% to all experience gained, and anything above that will get you a plus 10% experience that you gain in the game. This may not sound like a lot, but when you are playing one of the earlier versions of the game, the fastest way to gain experience points is to not run around and kill everything. It's to get treasure and retrieve it from a dungeon and bring it back to a town. So if you get a sizable hoard and you get a significant amount of experience from that, having a plus 5% or plus 10% bonus on top of that, that's going to go a long way to helping you advance a lot faster than someone who doesn't have that bonus. It's an interesting way of looking at things. One of the cool things about encounters is how much a creature reaction to the party is important to the game. The original concept of OD&D was that you were always going to be doing a dungeon crawl. And your goal was to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the dungeon in order to get the really good treasure and bring it back and get experience and level up and then go back and do it again. So if you are going to try to go into a dungeon and kill everything, you are not only not going to get very far session to session, you're probably going to die. And so negotiating with intelligent creatures or tricking unintelligent creatures and getting around them and avoiding combat is every bit as important as going around and killing everything. This is not a murder hobo game. You have to think on your feet in order to advance into the dungeon a lot deeper. So if you're negotiating with a creature and you give them a bribe or you offer to do some kind of service for them or ask them what they need and if it doesn't violate your alignment, you can decide that you'll help them out, well then you can avoid a whole section of the dungeon where you don't have to go killing everything and going hack and slash on it all. This is interesting because while this is going on, it's going to create dynamics inside the dungeon. So why would the goblins let you pass so that you can attack the hobgoblins? Shouldn't they be friends? You have to figure out why on earth they're going to let you pass to do that. Well, maybe they're fighting over a water source that's nearby, and they think that even if the PCs don't go in and just wipe out the hobgoblins, maybe they can weaken them enough that the goblins can go in and assert their dominance over that natural resource, and it would put them in a much better position inside the dungeon. Moreover, if you're going back to the same dungeon over and over and over again to go deeper and deeper and deeper, all these things that the PCs do as they pass all these different creatures and negotiate or fight or avoid, that's all going to add up over time, and so the dungeon itself comes alive, much the same way that folks in modern games will make a city come to life. 
it's really a cool feature and it's something that I I think some of the modern games miss out a little bit on. Now, movement in this game is always given in terms of inches. This goes back to its wargaming roots where you would have a ruler out and you would say that this unit can move so many inches in a combat round. And that really comes into old school D&D. One inch equals 10 feet indoors or 10 yards outdoors. What's fascinating to me is that this was a split that happened inside early D&D. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, along with OD&D, always gave their measurements in terms of inches, because that's how many inches you would measure out for your miniatures as you move them around. You weren't necessarily playing on a grid paper. Mulvey and Cook, however, gave all their measurements in terms of feet. There was much more of a leaning on the concept of playing theater of the mind, and so putting it as inches didn't work out as much. Just a neat little bit of history in the game. Now, when a player gets into combat, their movement is going to be one-third their full rate, because that inch is per turn, which is about 10 minutes in-game time. One-third would normally be probably between one or two inches, and a player could move maybe 20 or 30 feet in a round. They could decide to dash and take a double of that movement, two-thirds of their full movement rate, but then they wouldn't be able to attack. A little bit of minor math involved, but it's simple enough once you figure it out. It's interesting, however, that there is nothing in this game that talks about restrictions on whether or not you can attack and then move, or once you attack, your movement is now done. That doesn't exist here. There is also nothing in this game that talks about the idea of a parting shot for any character that moves in and out of melee range. And I think this is part of the old school charm. These rules are left out because the referee, the GM, is supposed to be looking at the situation and determining, based on their understanding of that in-world situation, whether or not something can or cannot be done. So if you're running up to a dragon and you're going to slice, maybe you can run away because the dragon's very big and you're very little and it's paying attention to other things. But if you're running up to a humanoid and you attack, well, maybe they're going to engage you and you can't quite move around them after you take a swing with your sword or your mace or your jab with your spear or anything like that. And that's just left up to the GM to determine. In this situation, you cannot do that. Something that more modern gamers don't like because they want the rules spelled out a little bit more clearly. They don't want to have an unfair GM constantly handicap their movements. But in the old school concept, this is a referee. They're judging the situation in the game as best as they see it, and their rulings are final. It is rulings over rules. This also applies to things like parting shots. You can say, I'm going to run in between these two creatures to try to get to the trapdoor and dive through. And the referee can look at that and say, all right, well, you're passing through two people and they're ready to jab at you. So they're each going to get an attack on you as you go by. And that's something that the referee says. That's something that's actually going to happen. Different concept of playing the game, but it does have its own charm and I do like it. When you are trying to hit, one of the things that this game has, because it is a full retro clone, is Descending Armor Class. This is not intuitive for modern gamers, for a reason. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you were gamed as a kid. I grew up with Descending Armor Class. I understand how it's supposed to work. I can do it just fine, but I do like Ascending AC a whole lot better. But let me explain how this works. There is an attack matrix on page 15 in this book that lists armor class 9, which is the highest unarmored armor class, all the way down to minus 5. In front of that are different class categories. You have the fighter, a magic user, and the cleric and the thief share one, along with monster hit dice. And what you do is you look at your character's level, see where they are, and then go across and you write down what value you need to hit each of those armor classes. This is actually on the sheet for Iron Falcon, and it existed in a lot of the old school games. So if you're a first level fighter, and you're trying to make an attack, you would roll the d20, and you would look on your chart. And say you rolled a 14. You would look across and find out where 14 was, and tell the GM, I hit armor class 5. 
the GM would look at the armor class of the creature and say if you hit or not. It's a little bit clunky compared to how we think of ascending armor class and just rolling the dice and adding a bonus. And if I get over the armor class, I actually hit the thing. But it works. It has its own charm. Um, not my preferred style of play, but I can do it. I do think people would benefit from actually trying this old school method every now and again. My relationship with Iron Falcon is interesting because I have no nostalgia for it. I never played OD&D. It predated me. I started with Moldvay and Cook, Basic and Expert. However, if you are interested in the history of the game, this is a good way to jump into that era of original Dungeons and Dragons, particularly because the buy-in is not that big. You can download the PDF of the core rulebook for free. I'll put the link below. And you can buy the actual print copy off of Amazon. A paperback is going to run you $9, and a hardback is going to run you $21. That's not a whole lot of money to get a complete game that's going to have monsters, your character classes, your advancements, spell listings, combat rules, and everything else that goes along with it. I didn't even get into hirings and building strongholds and all of that stuff. That's a whole nother aspect of gameplay that is way too much for this type of review. So I appreciate this glimpse into the game when things were not set at all. Rulings over rules really was the order of the day. And the person that we call the Dungeon Master or the Game Master now really was a referee. They were adjudicating what was happening in situation and determining what penalties and what bonuses were going to be applied in any given situation. And there's something freeing about that that I think everyone should experience at some point, particularly if you are a Game Master and you're tired of dealing with rule lawyers all the time. I do prefer a game that has some more modern sensibilities. I've already said I do like Ascending AC a whole lot more than Descending Armor Class, although I do miss the charm of saying I have a negative two armor class. That was always kind of fun. I do like having measurements in feet instead of inches. I don't want to do mental gymnastics. I just want to look at the information and know what it means. Although if you're immersed in the inches equals 10 feet concept, you're just going to be able to do that without thinking. And so I understand it's not really that difficult. I just don't want to do it right now. And then I do like a more bulleted presentation of information, particularly in the spell listings and in the monster listings to where I can look down and glance and know the range, the area of effect, how long it takes to cast something without having to actually read a block of text to do it. These are things that I prefer, but the key word is there, prefer. I like Iron Falcon for what it gives you. It's really, really cool. It is an incredible emulation of Dungeons and Dragons of the original game as best as Chris Gonerman could do it. And for that, I thank him very much. I want to thank everyone who has subscribed, commented, liked, and just interacted with this channel in any way, shape, or form. We are up to over 1,100 subscribers, which blows my mind. And this last week, I actually was able to hit the monetization threshold, so I'm now rolling in the pennies. Thank you so much. I could not have done this without you. If you're interested in looking into some more things that I'm working on, I invite you to check out dmtales.com. Going to be listing a lot of my videos as well as write-ups and things like campaign recaps that are going to go up over on that website. Also, if you'd like to support me and make sure that I stay awash in new games to review and concepts to look at, you can support me over on my Patreon. I would really, really appreciate it. This is the first of three videos I'm going to be doing around Iron Falcon. Next week, I'm going to be looking at an addition to the game called Iron Falcon 75, in which you play people who are living in 1975 in a world where magic is awakening. It is really cool, and I cannot wait to talk about it with all of you. Until then, happy playing, everyone.